what I'm going to be talking about is exploring some of the drivers for investing in occupational health and well-being services um, and um, to share some research that was carried out within Nuffield Health and also to um, try and bring that to life a little bit by sharing a case study with you of how uh, we've used some of our health data and some of those lenses to uh, take our health and wellbeing programmes forward and add value. So I thought, though, you know, what is, why is well-being having such a high prominence at the moment? As an occupational health practitioner, I would argue that protecting and promoting the health of people at work is what occupational health is all about and has been all about. But suddenly, well-being seems to have a real focus. And is well-being the same as occupational health or not? And does it matter? I suppose those were all the sorts of thoughts that were going through my head, and I'm hoping to be able to explore some of those a little bit more now. Um, and to look at where occupational health fits in. But just before I start that, just to tell you a little bit about Nuffield Health, for those of you who haven't come across us, um, we are the uh, UK's largest provider of um, health and wellbeing services outside of the NHS. Um, we have uh, 12,500 staff, roughly. It's gone up since then. We've acquired some more businesses. Um, and uh, we provide a range of um, services mainly grouped into preventative health, which is where I would sit occupational health, although some people would put it maybe in another area. Um, we also provide health assessments, primary care services such as GPs, practice nurses, private GP and practice nurse services. We're the largest provider of physiotherapy <laughs> services outside of the NHS. Um, we have uh, 75 fitness and well-being centres or gyms, uh, which the public can just buy membership to, and we put clinical services into some of those. Um, and in addition, we have a large corporate business where we work with about 200 clients providing a range of well-being services that could be anything from um, just providing a gym to providing a fully integrated service, including physio, occupational health, practice, practice nursing, primary care, um, you, you name it. Um, if it's in the health and well-being arena, then we may provide it. And it tends to be a bit of a pick and mix as to what people will choose. We also have a hospitals division, and we have 31 private hospitals, um, everywhere from Glasgow down to Plymouth. Um, so um, if staff or people do need treatment, we also have that available to us. That makes my job very interesting as an occupational health nurse in terms of our own business. Um, but we also, as I mentioned earlier, have a commercial occupational health business as well. So what are the drivers for investing in occupational health and well-being? Well, Nuffield Health, in conjunction with Ashridge Business School, um, were very interested in this area. And we're looking at what are the strategic imperatives for companies to make that sort of investment. And they carried out some research, and their research identified it identified six imperative lenses, as they called it, um, six strategic imperatives which they think influences companies one way or another to invest in occupational health. The first of those is the war for talent. And by that, we mean attracting the right people into the business in the first place. Marketplaces are very competitive. Getting the right people, getting them to come in and stay is really important to some people. So that will be a main driver of having a range of benefits that are going to look attractive to get people in. Contrast that with compliance and risk management. That, ty that type of driver tends to be in organisations which are highly regulated, where there is perhaps a large health and safety requirement, and perhaps the focus for the wellbeing programmes in a, in a company which has that as their primary driver will be different to one that has um, the war for talent as their primary driver, for example. The next one is sustaining high performers. This is about once you've attracted your top talent in, keeping them and keeping people in the business that you want and not losing them to your competitors. And again, the types of initiatives that you have will vary. Just to give you an example, we work with um, a number of corporate banks and legal firms um, in the city where this is clearly a big driver for them in terms of their well-being services. They will provide on-site gyms and all sorts of things for them. From an occupational health perspective, we have no health surveillance particular, or very minimal health surveillance other than some DSE-type regulations things. Um, but what we do do for them is run things like 
uh, we have um, one of our groups, we have a menopause group because the, the, the workforce has a large percentage of women. It has a large percentage of women who are going through the menopause. And um, we have, um, the, they asked the occupation, we asked what they would like. This came back as something that, that a lot of people would appreciate. And so um, a group called Hot Flushes, which is basically a self-help group, <laughs> was set up. <laughs> and it's chaired and run by the occupational health nurse on that site and company. Now, that would be obviously not appropriate necessarily in the construction industry, but, which is very male-dominated, but was very appropriate in this one. And that's about fostering community. That's about, you know, it's, it's more about sharing experience. So that was quite a, an interesting example. Productivity and absence control tends to build on a different driver. Productivity is about how do you get the best out of your people? And, and you could argue that everybody's going to want that one as well. But here, I suppose, we're thinking about things like the ageing workforce. We're thinking about the um, more and more sedentary lifestyle that many of us lead. Um, and how does that impact on productivity? So again, a lot of the types of services that you might invest in, if that's your primary driver, might be different if you, than, than from some of the others. Um, so we know already, for example, that since the, the abolition of the retirement age, default retirement age three years ago, that are already a quarter of a million more people past six, age 65 in the workplace today than there were three years ago. And we know that that's going to increase. And we, we also need to acknowledge that with, despite all the good things that we can do to try and promote health, as one gets older, one will get niggles and pains. And I think, therefore, occupational health services and wellbeing services that don't take into account just the needs of that workforce, which is, which is changing, um, will fall behind the curve. And so we, we need to think differently about perhaps what we provide. Cost of ill health provision keeping absence costs down. 26.4 million pounds, I think, um, was uh, the cost of absence in 2009, 2010. Now, this driver, actually, uh, the research found, was applicable to all companies. Um, so it didn't matter what company you were, keeping your absence costs down um, was really, really, really crucial to all of them. Um, although they may have other lenses that, that show as well. Maybe as an occupational health nurse, that's probably quite good because that's often where occupational health in terms of case management um, you know, is, is very much seen to support that sickness absence process. And the final one is having a well-being culture. And that's not having widgets in a tin that, you know, we have a gym, we have this. It's actually about the culture of the organisation. And I think that's worth exploring a little bit more. So this really brings out what do we mean by... Um, a culture of well-being and what do we mean by well-being as opposed to occupational health. I think that in well-being you need to have various layers and this is a bit like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, in your foundation there you need to have all the basics in that. So that would be your health and safety compliance and regulation, that will be about fair pay and conditions, it's about having a good working environment for people and that's pretty much the sort of the basic core. You then layer that, perhaps, with your health-related interventions. And this is where occupational health I see coming in, along with things like physiotherapy, private medical insurance, income protection schemes, um, some of the health surveillance aspects that, you, that are needed, all the health-related benefits and the fitness-related benefits would, I think, fit into this total health management piece there. Moving on from that is the community, and that's both within the business and perhaps external to it. That's about your social groups. That's about having maybe your hot flushes group or something else that's appropriate. But it's, it's about having something which takes people not only within the workplace, but also socially. Um, we've just recently introduced a volunteering scheme within our business, which I know a lot of businesses do do, but that was quite new for Nuffield and actually, you know, really something very nice. We've also had an apprenticeship scheme where we bring in people with learning disabilities and with physical disabilities to give them a, a chance to work um, for people who may not find it easy to get work. And those type of sort of community values actually really do, I think, help within the, the feel-good of the organisation. None of that's going to work, however, unless you've got good leadership. Good leadership is absolutely essential. If you haven't got leaders who are living the brand, who are actually understanding and believing in the well-being agenda, it ain't going to work. Um, because you can have all of that, but if your policies and your procedures and your systems and what you do in reality contradicts what you're trying to do in well-being, then you're, you're not going to really have a well-being culture. You're going to have well-being widgets that people can tap into. 
And re related to all of that are the values and the values of the company. And those values have to have a well-being thread. It has to value the people in the organisation for it to be meaningful. So that's what I mean by a well-being culture. And as I said, I think occupational health fits into the um, total health management piece. So I see occupational health in, as in the hub of the total health management piece. I think occupational health touches and liaises and works with all those other areas, excuse me. <coughs> um, and I'm just going to move on to the case study because I'm just conscious of time. So I wanted just to share with you, um, not a case study from within Nuffield Health, but one from one of our clients that we work with who happen to be a telecommunications company. They have a very good um, integrated healthcare model and provide a lot of services um, uh, to primarily at head office and their larger sites. But they are a global company, and within the UK, they have workers all over the place, and not all of them will have access to all of these facilities. However, the occupational health service is delivered across the whole of the UK, and we also provide health surveillance programmes for them for those work, that part of the workforce that needs it. What we found when we started working with them on case management is that we had a real peak in referrals from a particular part of their business. And that business was the call centre area, where they had 2,000 staff working in a call centre. And we had a really disproportionate number of referrals from that, at that part of the business. And you could argue, is that just because they're really proactive in managing absence, or was there something else going on there? So we wanted to start drilling down into that. So rather than providing a remote case management model, we put an occupational health nurse to go in on site. We started to work with the managers, and we started to look at you know, what, what are the drivers for absence being so high. We also noticed that referrals into occupational health were quite late. People had been off for quite a while before they were referred in. So we worked with the managers to try and get them to change their referral pattern. We got them to, to understand what we could and couldn't do. We spent time understanding the triggers and the uh, limitations of what they could accommodate in terms of rehabilitation back into the workplace. And by that collaborative working, we managed within the first year to get sickness absence down from 9.5% in that section of their workforce to 3.4%. We still have an occupational health nurse going in on site there once uh, a week. And the first hour is an open hour for managers to go in and, and discuss things. And the nurse is saying it's almost not long enough, except that you can't give them any more than that, because we need that to see the individuals who are being referred in. So it clearly works, that type of model. Linked to that, we also, within the first year, looked at income protection and the people who were going on to income protection schemes. It seemed to be if you'd had worked at a certain grade and if you were off sick for more than 26 weeks, you would get income protection. But it was possible to go into that pathway without ever being seen by occupational health. And we felt that was somehow wrong, that there needed to be more involvement with supporting people through, you know, could we do something to help them back into work beforehand? Um, we worked with the income protection provider and the human resources department. And within a relatively... Um, short time, we were able to set up a joint consent process with the income protection provider. So if someone applied for that scheme, there would automatically be agreement of sharing of information between occupational health and the income protection provider so that we could case manage that. We did a review of all the open cases and found 25% of those people on that we were able to manage back into work with redeployment because it hadn't really been explored. It was always could they do their role, not could they do other roles, or what could we do to support them more. So by taking a more proactive approach, we actually were able to do that. And the final part of this example is um, a relating to health surveillance. We, um, the reason I've got that picture there is uh, they have a number of riggers who climb these masts that I would nowhere near want to go up. I'm terrified of heights. Um, and see them climbing up there and sort of working on with harnesses and things on and hanging and working at height and really scares the life out of me. But nevertheless, clearly a high-risk activity needs health surveillance. And we have a climber's medical that we put in place for this workforce. When we inherited the contract, there were quite a significant number of the climbers who had failed previous medicals and who had been redeployed into other roles. Um, we actually carried out a review of everybody who was officially a, a, a rigger and a climber, um, and we found that actually a large proportion of them were failing on the, 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 the fitness part of the test, and we had a chest to step test in that a medical, which um, assesses people's ability to climb and to climb for the height and the distance that they needed to climb at. And that was the part they were failing. 
So what we have done differently is we have a physiologist who carries out those medicals as part of our health assessment team. A physiologist we use a bit like an occupational health technician for those who are familiar with that term, but they have a degree in anatomy and physiology. They often have a background in sports science or some other sort of science. They were able to work with individuals to give them a programme to improve their fitness. They were able to give them techniques to improve their lung function. We then also gave them three months free gym membership at any of our Nuffield Health gyms because most of these weren't anywhere near head office where the on-site gym was. They were all over the UK. Um, and we introduced them to the health mentor on site in those gyms to support their fitness programme. They were then reassessed three months down the line and all but one person is now back to climbing and fit for climbing duties. And that's because it wasn't just about identifying through the health surveillance programme that they weren't fit to climb. It was about doing something about it to get them fit to climb. Um, and that's where the added value is. So we actually feel that, well, we know <laughs> that with the work that we have done with this particular organisation, that we have actually given them a cost saving within the first two years of almost £3 million just by those three initiatives. So it just shows you if you're proactive and you want to do it, you can make a difference. And my very final slide, in case I'm over time, is just my conclusion. <laughs> Investing in occupational health and wellbeing service has to be good business sense. And I think there's nobody in this room that wouldn't agree with that. Good leadership is absolutely essential because without good leadership, it isn't going to work. <laughs> Collaborative working is key. I've already made the point about the, the widgets. It's not about the widgets. It's about how you put it all together and implement it strategically. So my, I suppose my final message is it's not, you know, should we invest in occupational health? Can we afford to invest in occupational health? Is it can you afford not to? And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>